Okay, we might have some that are still coming in, but I'll go ahead and get started with introductions. So good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Estes Werther. I'm the general counsel for the League of Arizona Cities and Towns, and welcome to this presentation. Today, we're gonna to be discussing Senate Bill 1487 and the overview and strategies for handling investigations and lawsuits. So we have three speakers today. Um, so first is gonna be Nick Ponder. He's the legislative director for the League where he oversees and manages the league's response to issues uh, facing municipalities at the state capitol. After spending more than 13 years working in the public sector defined benefit pension systems in both public safety and public employee plans, Nick joined the league in June 2017. In June 2018, after serving one year as the pension policy analyst and lobbying on tax issues, Nick moved into the role of legislative director. Nick holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from the Ohio State University. Uh, Jay Caboo and Alexis Deneman are partners in the investigations and appellate groups of Perkin Coie's Phoenix office. Alexis is an Arizona native, formerly the editor-in-chief of the Arizona Law Review, and before joining Perkins Coie, clerked for Judge Michael Daly Hawkins on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Jay came to Arizona almost 20 years ago to clerk for Chief Judge Mary Schroeder on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Prior to joining Perkins Coie in 2012, Jay was a partner at Osborne Maladon, and before that was Chicago Mayor Richard M. Daly's public safety advisor. Jay and Alexis have successfully defended municipalities against various 1487 complaints. Their work has ranged from providing counseling advice to representing municipalities in 1487 lawsuits at the Arizona Supreme Court. And right before we get started, I just kind of a couple housekeeping issues. Um, we do have a Q&A section. It'll either, depending on your device, be up above or at the bottom. Um, that's where we're taking questions. And so please type your questions as they come to you and we're gonna make sure to answer all of those towards the end. So with that, we'll go ahead and hand it off to Nick. You're on mute. I am on mute. That's what I said out loud uh, to myself. Anyway, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Christina said, Nick Ponder here, the legislative director for the league. I importantly noted in my bio that I started at the league in 2017 after 1487 had passed. So don't blame me, um, but <laughs> um, just kidding. Uh, so as we know, uh, I want to start off obviously with what we uh, think of as the role of, of incorporated cities and towns and and one of those uh, started originated with this or brought up this issue of 1487. Um, it actually dates back to uh, 2012 and then manifested itself over several several years. Um, we see our role in local governments uh, in one part, at least to uh, protect public health and safety. And in that, uh, we see that regulating trash uh, collection could be that. This actually originated out of the city of Bisbee um, with uh, what, we, what was called a plastic bag ban. Um, so historically, for various reasons, cities and sometimes even countries have banned single-use plastic bags, either because petroleum is used in them they're not recyclable and can damage expensive recycling machinery or because they're light, easily lost from landfills and can get caught in power lines, fences and swept out to sea um, and could pose harm to wildlife. So uh, as a side note, I was in Morocco last year for a couple of weeks, didn't see a single single use plastic bag. It was all cloth bags. So um, it's it's not unique to cities and towns here in the United States. Um, in, in 2007, uh, San Francisco banned single-use plastic bags for supermarkets, and then they expanded it in 2012. Uh, seeing an issue with, with blight and trash uh, that the city of Bisbee was facing in 2012, they actually passed a voluntary pilot program uh, discouraging the use of single-use plastic bags. Um, they saw some success in that, so in 2013, the city council voted actually to implement, um, uh, it was actually an involuntary ban. So and it was a ban of uh, single use plastic bags um, that actually became effective in 2014. 
this caught the attention of the Arizona Food Marketing Alliance, uh, who represents uh, all the supermarkets uh, and gas stations and some of those folks out there uh, here at the state capitol. And so in 2015, they asked Senator Nancy Bartow of Phoenix uh, to sponsor Senate Bill 1241 uh, that they believed would prohibit a city from banning what they called auxiliary containers. And within the language of auxiliary containers, uh, single use plastic bags was one of the items. Uh, and that bill ultimately passed the legislature almost on entirely on a party line vote. Um, in response, the city claimed that they had charter authority. Uh, Bisbee is a, is, a, is a charter city. Um, and they had charter authority and that the role of trash collection in public health and safety was an issue purely of local concern and thus that they could retain their ordinance. Um, so they saw the passage of, of the bill in, of 1241 in 2015. Um, in their view, obviously, the issue of, of plastic bags and how they impacted their city getting caught in fences and, and elsewhere um, was an issue of local concern. Obviously, um, their uh, intent on keeping their ordinance uh, upset certain folks in the legislature because it was their belief that the city was violating state law. As I said, on the other hand, the city believed the Arizona Constitution provided um, for municipal charters and that that was an area that they could control. So consequently, in 2016, we actually saw two bills. The first bill was House Bill 2131, which was sponsored by Warren Peterson of Gilbert. The key point in this bill is that they, they inserted into the auxiliary container language that was not included in the prior year was that these auxiliary containers were an issue of statewide concern. So um, they cleverly utilized uh, an opportunity where we thought something was of local concern to effectively use the legislature's arm to say that this was a statewide issue. Uh, so, and then, so that was, that was the auxiliary container bill. That bill also passed the legislature in 2016, but subsequently as that bill was going through to say that that issue was of statewide concern, a second bill was, was proposed and, and pushing through the legislature, which is uh, the topic of conversation here, Senate Bill 1487. Uh, so Senate Bill 1487 allows any legislator to make a claim against a local government, cities and counties, uh, who they believe are violating state law. Uh, the bill requires the attorney general to investigate the claims and then provide a response to that government's actions. Uh, there are three responses that the attorney general uh, can can provide. One is that it does that the the municipal action does not violate uh, state law. The second one, uh, under the does not violate uh, provision, obviously, if that is determined, then, then it, it, the issue is moot at that point. The second would be a may violate. Um, and under this provision, then the action immediately goes to the state Supreme Court for an official determination. It skips any other uh, processes in the legal, uh, legal process. And then the final is that it uh, does violate. Under this provision, there's no additional legal action unless the city wants to appeal. However, under appeal, um, unlike the may violate, the city doesn't have access to the Supreme Court immediately. It actually needs to start at the lower level courts and then go through, work its way through the process, which um, I think as we all know, can be a very lengthy process. Um, under a does violate and, and then under a does violate determined by the, the Supreme Court. So in either of those scenarios, a city in ta or town would be subject to a loss of one half of their state shared revenue until such time as they change their action uh, to no longer violate state law. So as some of you know, uh, and some of you may not, but state shared revenue actually accounts uh, on average for 40% of a, a municipality's total revenue. So if they're giving up one half of that, that's a 20% haircut, obviously. Um, or they've lost 20% of their total revenue uh, at that point in time. <laughs> at the time in 2016, we argued 
that uh, the law in particular that uh, does not violate or it does vi violate determination, I'm sorry, didn't allow for due process because a single, a single elected official was making a determination where the municipality would, would lose revenue before this, act this issue actually worked its way through the courts. So we didn't believe that, that it provided for just due process. Um, at the time, we also argued that, um, that there was already a process in place that uh, a legislator or the legislature could sue uh, a municipality arguing that their actions were against the law and, and that that would provide for the proper due process um, and uh, determination whether or not that, that law was, was uh, that, that ordinance was legal and that would allow for municipalities then to take action thereafter without it being determined by an elected official. Um, as we all know, because we're discussing this today, we were unsuccessful in those arguments. Uh, and so 1487 has been in effect uh, since 2016. And um, we will talk later on uh, in this conversation about our efforts to change that going forward. But at this point in time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Alexis and Jay to further discuss um, the issue of 1487 and some language. Great, thanks so much, Nick. Um, so we're gonna talk briefly about the, the way that these complaints play out with the Attorney General's office um, in our experience. Um, and some of this is laid out in the, in the text of, of the, um, of the statute and some of it is, has been what the AG has sort of done practically um, in, in following through on these complaints. So, so the process starts when a legislator files a complaint. Um, as I'm sure many of you have seen too, sometimes legislators um, threaten these complaints in advance of municipal le legislation. So sometimes the municipalities or the, the county has a heads up that that someone's unhappy and this might be coming and, and sometimes not, you know, sometimes this is a surprise. So once the legislator files the complaint, um, the attorney general's process begins. So he posts the complaints online to a very transparent website, um, just linked here. And you can go on and see every complaint, um, some of the supplemental materials, the, the, the attorney general's opinion, and then in the case of a Supreme Court case, the uh, court's decision. Um, so once the attorney general receives a complaint, he usually re um, requests that the city provide a response. Um, he, you know, he doesn't have to do that under the text of the statute. And in some cases he might not, um, if, it, if it's a pretty straightforward issue. Um, but, but in our experience, he typically requests a city response. The time frame under the statute is very short. So, the AG only has 30 days to write one of these opinions, analyzing the whether the, the um, local law violates state law. So we assume that they sort of start looking at this and writing pretty immediately, um, but they've in the past requested city responses within you know, 20 days or 15 days, sort of depending on the issue. Um, and they view that in, in formulating their response. Um, They've also, you know, the attorney general also might reach out to a city or a county and say, hey, can you send me this piece of information or that piece of information? So in our experience, um, it's been a relatively collaborative process in terms of the attorney general sort of trying to get it right and, um, and, and, and get as much information as possible. Uh, Alexis, if I can just jump in for just yeah. a quick second, I just want to underscore for everyone and, and I want to welcome everyone, um, especially those of uh, you on the webinar who we've had a chance to work with. Uh, it's great to see everyone. Um, I just want to note that this process, uh, the only thing that is actually set in stone, in other words, that is written down either in uh, the law itself or in some kind of procedure, is the 30 day statutory time frame for the Attorney General to provide their report on whether or not it violates state law. These other procedures that Alexis just very accurately described are all ad hoc. Um, so they could change um, at any time. Uh, they could change with the new attorney general administration. 
The AG uh, has rulemaking power, but the AG has not promulgated rules uh, under the Arizona Administrative Code to deal with this, um, nor are there any other formal guidelines for dealing with this. Uh, all by way of saying, and I think this will be a little bit of a theme as we go forward, there is room for some creativity here. And as Alexis mentioned, the AG certainly has the statutory obligation to investigate these complaints. Um, but our experience has been that the AG's office is open to dialogue with the municipalities um, you know, about the nature of any particular complaint and about what, if any, tweaks to the normal process that we've gotten used to uh, should be made. Um, so, you know, the, as Alexis mentioned, they do afford a chance for a municipal response Usually they, they, they say that's within 15 days. And I can tell you from conversations with them that the reason it's 15 days, even though it's very short is because it's half the period that they have by law. So they basically gave the cities half the period to respond and themselves half the period to write the report having um, seen the response. So it is a little bit um, flexible, uh, but the AG's 30 day time frame is not. That's the only thing that's provided by law. And just before we, we left the discussion of steps, I wanted to note and encourage folks uh, to think about, you know, whether in a given case, if your municipality is, um, you know, a target for one of these investigations, there's no reason not to have a dialogue um, with the Attorney General's office, and spe specifically, it's the Solicitor General's office uh, that deals with these complaints. Um, if you think there's, you know, uh, special circumstances where you guys are going to need to um, work out a different procedure than usual, as long as it's within the 30 day time frame, I would we would really encourage folks to, to reach out and talk to them. They're, they, they have proven, uh, you know, very open to dialogue. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, so at the end of the 30 days, the AG will generally issue a written um, report. They haven't always um, where um, sometimes legislators have dismissed complaints or the action is moot because the, the um, governing body of the local authority has, has taken a different action, but generally you'll see a formal response at the end of the 30 day period. It might be a page, it might be 30 pages. It just sort of depends on the issue. Um, so, you know, we're gonna just walk through each of the three possible outcomes in a little more detail that Nick outlined. Um, and again, the two most straightforward um, things that could happen in terms of what the attorney general's response looks like is, the attorney general could find that this doesn't violate state law. And then that's just sort of the end of it. Um, the, the investment of resources on the front end um, is, is important. And in some cases, the um, attorney general has decided that, you know, the, that the local law doesn't violate state law. And, and we think, you know, strong advocacy at the front end is, is important. And the AG is certainly willing to, um, to conclude conclude that there's no violation when there's no violation. Um, and again, some of these complaints have been so, um, how shall I put this? So, so clearly that it's been so clear that the municipality's law hasn't violated state law that the AG has just written a very short, short response. Um, so the next option, um, which is, which is a, ch a challenging one for the reasons Nick outlined is the attorney general could find that, that the local law violates state law. And again, this has a pretty severe consequence, which is the withholding of um, the state shared revenue. This has been the least common outcome that we've seen in these, in these cases. Um, we've seen, seen it twice. Um, one was the Bisbee bag ordinance and another one was the Sedona ordinance related to to rental properties. Um, and Jay and I think that this outcome prevent, or presents one of the most interesting constitutional challenges that we haven't, that hasn't been adjudicated with respect to the constitutionality of 1487, which is the attorney general sort of summarily decides, hey, this local law violates state law. And then there's this huge monetary consequence to the city. Um, and so there's no, there's no, automatic judicial review. You know, you, as Nick pointed out, a city could bring another lawsuit. Um, you could be filed, you know, as a special action and you might be able to file a special action in the Supreme Court or you'd have to go to the lower courts, but there's no automatic judicial review of this decision. So um, it, to us, at least this pre 
presents a huge separation of powers issue with the attorney general deciding you know, th that there's a violation of state law and then there's this huge consequence to the city. So if this is an outcome um, that happens in a complaint you're dealing with, I, um, I think we would just suggest that, that this process is very suspect in, the, in a case where the attorney general decides like, hey, this violates state law and then, then there are these huge consequences to cities. So. I think as a, as a practical matter, the attorney general's office, in our view, certainly in reasonable minds could differ. And there are a lot of experienced people on this call. So we'd welcome a contrary view, certainly. But in our view, the attorney general's office seems hesitant to conclude that something does violate state law, in part because I, our belief is they want to avoid these constitutional challenges. Um, I think the attorney general's office and, and people in the SG's office um, seem acutely aware of the fact that having them you know, an executive branch official make a decision about what does or doesn't violate the law and have an immediate consequence, you know, in the hundreds or tens of millions of dollars for a municipality strikes them. And I think strikes me certainly as um, not how it's supposed to work, right? If, 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 if it's the job of the courts to say what the law is, uh, it can't also be the job of the attorney general's office to decide when something is or isn't constitutional and then for a consequence to flow from that. Um, so whether we will see a case where they actually come out and say this does violate and whether the sort of the brinksmanship happens where the cities don't don't repeal the ordinance or don't take other action to moot it as Alexis described in those other cases sort of remains to be seen. Um, but that is sort of uncharted territory that the courts have yet to address. Yeah. And Jay, I'll let you um, sort of describe option three, which seems to be a, a frequent choice of the attorney general's office, which is what happens if, if the AG decides that the ordinance may violate state law. Sure, so um, th this has been a frequent um, conclusion of the AG's office in several high profile cases lately. Um, the, the, for example, the attorney general's office concluded that the city of Phoenix um, trip fee ordinance regarding ride, ride share and other ground transportation providers at the airport concluded that that ordinance may violate state law. Um, although in making, in reaching that conclusion, the report that the AG wrote and the briefing that the AG filed at the Supreme Court and in the amicus briefing that the AG solicited for the Supreme Court um, took a very strong advocacy position that it did violate state law. So you, you know, we sort of noted this tension between their official conclusion, which was it may violate state law, and then the advocacy position they took, which was very much an adverse position to the city's ordinance saying this violates state law for all these reasons. Um, so as Nick and Alexis sort of foreshadowed uh, a little bit ago, in these cases where it may violate state law, the AG has no choice but to file a special action at the Arizona Supreme Court and the text of the statute says that the Supreme Court has to give it precedence over all other cases. Um, you know, again, I think the, the language of the statute leaves some room for interpretation. And this is another area where um, we're happy just to share with the group the, the, the learnings we've had from the couple cases we've handled. Um, there haven't been that many cases that the court has handled. Um, but you know the rules of special action procedure and the and the rules of civil appellate procedure don't really deal well with a case like this, which is sort of an original jurisdiction case that happens on a, you know the rules set a schedule, for example, that doesn't really work that well uh, for cases like this. So what we've noticed in the last couple of cases is that we have um, talked to the solicitor general's office. They've let us know that the brief is coming. Um, if not, you know, the day it's happening, then, you know, we're in touch with them in the days beforehand. And once the AG files his special action, the Supreme Court, um, we have worked with the Solicitor General's office on a stipulated briefing schedule to handle that matter um, and then submitted it to the court um, as a stipulated schedule, <clears throat> asking that the court enter the briefing schedule. And um, usually that includes um, the date for a response by the municipality, the date for a reply by the SG's office, uh, the date for amicus briefs to be filed, and a date for um, consolidated responses to amicus briefs to be filed. Um, so we've sort of come to that schedule, um, although certainly, again, in particular cases, um, 
you may find it helpful to discuss with the Solicitor General's office, you know, other deadlines. And, and they've been very flexible uh, in terms of, of making sure everyone has time to do the briefing and, um, you know, get done what needs to be done. Um, um, in terms of, you know, where, where the Supreme Court has been, uh, obviously there haven't been that many cases and they've gone both ways. Um, you know, most people on the call, certainly the league uh, will be familiar with all the cases, but um, there was, you know, the, the ones we can think of quickly certainly are the um, Tucson Firearms Disposal Ordinance um, in which the court held that firearms uh, were a matter of statewide concern. Um, I continue to have my own views about whether that case was rightly decided, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it is the law of our land. Um, and then of course, the more recent cases, uh, the trip fee ordinance in which um, the court held that that ordinance was uh, appropriate and constitutional. Um, one thing that we're, we're sure on right now is that the requirement originally in SB 1487, that the cities post a bond in order to have their day in court is unconstitutional. Um, that was a matter that was raised in the Tucson uh, firearms disposal case. Um, and it was, it was uh, the bond was not enforced in that case, although the court did not decide whether it was constitutional um, explicitly. Um, more recently, the court has said that the bond requirement is unintelligible and thus unenforceable. Uh, so presently, no one has to post a bond. Uh, notably, even before that decision, the SG's office did not request a bond. Uh, I think, again, everyone realizes that no matter what the basis for your concern is, the idea that a municipality has to pay to have its day in court and has to pay an enormous sum of money um, raises serious due process and access to justice issues that no one really wants to wrestle with. Um, so no worries about the bond requirement that has been ruled unconstitutional. Whether or not the legislature takes up uh, you know, amending that portion of the statute to make it intelligible. I'd, I'd actually be curious, Nick and I haven't had a chance to talk about that, but I'd actually be curious as to what Nick thinks uh, the future of that is, whether they'll let it die or whether they're gonna try to craft some bond requirement. Um, but maybe we can talk about that in the Q and A. That's my question for Nick. Um, so in these cases where um, there is the may violate, there's also the question of um, whether the court's uh, gonna have oral argument. and. Um, I, it's just worth noting that the court has had mixed responses uh, to all that stuff. Um, so I think I touched a moment ago on, and I guess I'll get back to oral argument in a second, on the time frame. But you know, in recent cases, we have proposed briefing schedules that give the municipalities more than 30 days to respond uh, and file their brief at the Supreme Court. Um, the SG's office has been really flexible. They have not tried to get it done in 15 days. And even though the statutory language says that the court has to give precedence to this, um, you know, the court deals with it on an expedited but reasonable time frame. Um, this is not an emergency matter for the court when these things come up. And um, the court has taken, um, you know, less time than its usual petitions for review docket to put these on the docket and get a scheduling order in place. But this is not handled in the same way, for example, as um, like an election challenge or a death penalty stay or anything like that. That's that's not uh, the practical experience that we've had. And I don't think anyone involved in the process is looking for that to happen. Um, so in terms of time frame, you know, things have taken several months to get sorted out in terms of getting the, the case fully briefed um, between the filing of the special action and the case being fully at issue, all the amicus briefs are in, responses to amicus briefs are in, um, you know, that's been anywhere from 60 to close to 120 days. And, um, you know, the court has taken it up after that. We, just as to talk about some procedural issues, um, the court has shown mixed interest in having oral argument uh, in these cases. Frankly, both the Solicitor General's office um, and we thought that the court would be interested in oral argument in the trip fees litigation uh, over the Sky Harbor trip fees. Um, that matter really captured the attention not only of many folks in Arizona, but also sort of of the national press. And, and, and there was a lot of, you know, uh, like public discussion of it. Um, we jointly requested oral argument in that case. Uh, the court chose not to have oral argument and just submitted down the briefs and said, we're good. Um, which is certainly fine, um, but you know, there's no reason not to request oral argument in a case if you want it. Um, the court's going to deal with it or not deal with it. 
Um, notably, I think perhaps um, as one of my mentors used to say, uh, washed on the shoals of the reality of being turned down for oral argument in the, in the trip fees case, we did not request oral argument. <laughs> um, uh, there was no re formal request for oral argument in other cases. Um, and the court just a couple weeks ago issued a sua sponte order setting oral argument in the ongoing elections, uh, Tucson elections case. So the court has scheduled that case for oral argument on its own motion. That's going to be heard January 12th, unless there are, um, you know, COVID related changes to the court schedule, which we can't uh, predict. Um, and then in terms of uh, cases when they are set for oral argument, I just want to note that for those of you who are familiar with um, traditional petition for review practice in the Supreme Court, you know, usually there are petitions for review filed, perhaps a response. Once the case is set for oral argument, the court usually allows um, supplemental briefing to be filed within 20 days of the letter setting the case for oral argument. That has not been uh, our experience in this context. Um, the court has not indicated that it wants further briefing. Um, and one thing that municipalities may want to consider is that because the state is the petitioner in these cases, so the state gets the first brief, the municipalities then get their second brief, the state then gets to go last. And especially if you're raising challenges to the constitutionality of the ordinance uh, of the uh, 1487 bill, or if you are raising um, constitutional challenges to, or other substantive challenges to the state legislation that you believed that, this, that the, that is at stake, right? So the state law that is believed to conflict with the local law, um, you may be in a position where there's, you only get one brief on a topic that you're raising affirmatively. So just query uh, in the name of brainstorming best practices, uh, query whether in some cases the municipality would wanna request leave to file a SIR reply or a supplemental brief uh, where you're not the petitioner, right? Because if you're never gonna be the petitioner, but if you're raising a constitutional challenge in response, they then reply, there's some argument, and we think it's you know, something the court would, would at least consider, even if not grant, uh, that you should be allowed sort of last at bat uh, on the argument you first brought to the court. Um, so that's a, just a practice point that we think is still open in terms of how to handle cases, especially where oral argument is set. Um, they haven't requested supplemental briefing. They certainly could, but that doesn't mean um, you know, the municipality couldn't uh, request leave for a supplemental brief. And frankly, that's something that we would, uh, you know, if it, Alexis and I would raise that affirmatively with the Solicitor General's office and see if they would agree to it. Um, again, they've been pretty constructive uh, and collegial about making sure that the court has a full record. Um, I guess as long as we're on the subject of record, let me also note the fact that Alexis and I have um, noted that the odd posture here where there's no fact finding, it's just at the Supreme Court, which traditionally is not a court where facts are found. Uh, they traditionally just obviously review the facts found in the trial court. Um, it does leave uh, room for creativity and for uncertainty with regard to how to create the factual record upon which the court is going to rule. Um, there, in some cases, uh, the parties have submitted declarations or affidavits. Um, in some cases, uh, the parties have asked the court to take judicial notice of judicially noticeable facts. But um, one unique uh, part of this kind of litigation is making sure that the court has an appropriate factual record on which to rule. And in cases where there are factual disputes, um, that, that's still an open question as to how the best way to resolve them is. Um, the AG hasn't you know, tried to challenge anyone submitting an affidavit about facts. And usually there are things like you know, an affidavit from a city clerk, for example, authenticating certain city records or attesting to the city procedure. Um, but you could imagine cases where um, there's a factual dispute and how to get those facts properly found and, and before the court remains sort of an open question uh, for which there are no written procedures at this point. Um, and then last, uh, to, to, to get back to the, to the slide, last but not least is the subject of attorney's fees. Um, you know, the statutes provide for the municipality to, to uh, it's not in 1487, but other statutes provide for the municipality or for the winning party to, to uh, receive its attorney's fees. Um, you know, 
Obviously, the costs of this litigation are substantial. Uh, you know, litigating an action at the Supreme Court can be quite pricey. Um, also, responding to the Attorney General's internal investigative process and preparing a response to the to the um, complaint, um, while certainly an uh, an opportunity that most municipalities have chosen to take and are glad to have, it's not without cost. Um, the Supreme Court has made clear that. Uh, attorney's fees are recoverable both for the investigative stage and for uh, the litigation itself. Whether they would be um, awarded in full in every matter, I think remains the subject of some debate, but certainly in the most recent opinion, um, the court awarded uh, the municipality's attorney's fees um, in full. Uh, so that certainly is something to keep in mind. Um, but just like anything else, you don't wanna forget to ask. Uh, if you're if you're litigating one of these cases, if you don't ask for your fees, you will not get your fees. Um, and it doesn't have to be a long ask. It can be it, it you know I think it's usually one or two lines at the end of your brief, uh, but those are key lines. So uh, certainly want to make sure that everyone who is wrestling with this at least considers whether to ask for them. I certainly we could see cases in which you would choose not to ask, um, but that's a tactical decision for sure. Uh, that you should make affirmatively rather than uh, not ask, not knowing it's a choice. So I want to make sure to flag that. And and the attorney general always asks. So um, they are asking for their fees in these cases. And Jay, I think the only thing I'd, I'd add to that um, sort of great summary of all the high points is, you know, just practically getting one of these um, legislator complaints. I think the way that we think about them and the framing, I would think, and kind of seeing what the complaint is, is, you know, looking at the complaint and saying first, you know, is there actually a conflict between the local law and the state law? And sometimes there just isn't, you know, legislator might think so, but, but, it, but there isn't one. And uh, the Supreme Court's recent city in the city, uh, recent opinion in the city of Phoenix case, um, there the court resolved the issue by deciding that there was no conflict between the local law and the statute. So I mean, that's sort of the first step. And then the second step is, okay, let's assume there's a conflict, um, like in the Tucson gun case, there was a, a conflict. And um, then the question is, well, is maybe the state law not constitutional? Does it violate the home rule provisions? Does it have some sort of other issue that it runs runs up against. So that, that's just sort of how we think about these complaints and how the court seems to be thinking about the complaints, which is, you know, is there a conflict? And if there is, then is the state law suspect on some other grounds? So I think, you know, I think that's- yeah, I, think, I think just following up on Alexis there, I mean, for, for, for people like us, and I probably like many people on this call, um, who are sort of, you know, Arizona, like municipal law and constitutional law uh, interested, or, or, or I can think of other words to use for people that like to read the Arizona Constitution a lot, but I won't. Um, I'm one of them. Um, it's a really good opportunity to like go back to first principles and try to think about, as Nick said at the beginning, sort of, you know, what are the original purposes of charter cities and what is the extent of their authority and what other provisions of the Arizona Constitution can municipalities look to in making some of these arguments about, as Alexis said, you know, is there actually a conflict or not? Um, is this, you know, and then and then from there, you know, is it a matter of local concern? What does it mean to be a matter of local concern? Certainly, the court has, uh, you know, it, given I think what many folks would see as disheartening guidance on what 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 is a matter of local concern and what you can really carve out uh, from the legislator's authority. But that doesn't mean the question is fully settled. And I expect that we're going to continue to see arguments about that in all these cases. Um, but you know, these cases at the especially once they're at the court are really an opportunity um, for the municipalities to think about first principles, think about what they're trying to do and to cast uh, their legislative action. Uh, within the mold of, you know, the types of things that cities were created to do, as 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 Nick said before, you know, things like, um, you know, uh, public public safety and public health and trash collection, um, just because uh, the plastic bag ordinance didn't end up uh, withstanding scrutiny doesn't mean that those arguments aren't good arguments. Um, and in the given case, I would encourage people to keep thinking about them. Um, you know, I, I really, when I worked for the city of Chicago, I, I loved uh, the granularity with which cities had to deal with these things, right? About how are we going to keep plastic bags out of the landfill? How are we going to keep them out of our recycling materials? Um, and although the, the legislature has tried very hard to say it's basically in charge of everything, um, we're going to keep pushing back until the court agrees with them. 
and we'd encourage you guys to think about ways to do that too. And to Jay's point, uh, the the Bisbee issue, uh, because it was a does violate, uh, it never actually went to the court. But the I, I think if I remember correctly, the um, the attorney general basically said because the state legislature said it was of statewide concern, it must be. And so I think we would we'll certainly love to argue that. But Bisbee Bisbee could couldn't move forward because they're a small community of 5,000 people. They have significant uh, costs in areas of, of public safety and elsewhere. And so uh, they, they risked losing $2 million in state shared revenue simply by trying to pursue this issue in the courts. And so it was cost prohibitive of them to do so. But since 1487 passed in 2016, we have undergone efforts, largely one effort, uh, to modify the language. At this point in time, the, the makeup of the legislature is not such that we would be able to repeal 1487. That may be the case in the future, uh, but, but certainly now that's not the case. And in, in the 2021 legislative session, it won't be the case either. In 2018, uh, we sponsored a bill, uh, well, we proposed a bill, Senate Bill 1374, which was ultimately sponsored by Senator Kate Brophy McGee uh, in the Phoenix Paradise Valley area, um, <clears throat> that was an attempt to modify 1487. So in part of the bill, we had actually worked with the Attorney General's office on some language related to the timelines that Alexis and Jay had talked about earlier. <clears throat> the because there's such a tight timeline and nothing actually articulated in statute that gives uh, the cities an opportunity to respond, we had agreed again with the AG's office to put some language in there. The law proposed to allow for a total of 60 days for response from the Attorney General's office, with the first 30 days of that time frame being for the local government um, to, to provide a response to the legislator's claim. Uh, and then the last 30 days for the, the Attorney General's office to make their determination. Uh, the, another provision of our amendment would have required that claims made against a local government must come from a legislator whose legislative district covers the local government that they're targeting. So in most of the cases of 1487, we've seen that the claims have come from a legislator not representing that district. And, and you know, our argument was that, um, that the legislator should have some responsibility to the constituents uh, against whom they're making the claim. Very infrequently has that happened. I think uh, Representative Fincham, who brought the Tucson gun case, uh, represents a very small part of Tucson uh, Representative, uh, or now who will be Senator-elect Barto, uh, who, if you recall from my earlier comments, drafted the 2015 bill at the request of the Arizona Food Marketing Alliance. She brought the claim against the city of Phoenix for the, their ride-sharing fee. But by and large, the claims have not come from legislators who um, represent some of the district that they're making a claim against. Uh, and then the final provision of our amendment would have allowed that under a does violate, it would have allowed for the government to, uh, the local government to file special action to the Supreme Court. So again, as I said earlier, allowing the local government direct access to the Supreme Court to resolve the issue. And that during that appeal process, uh, the AG couldn't take action on the state revenue, state shared revenue portion. Um, so that was obviously uh, very important to us because uh, we, we would want to, you know, a hold on the the reduction in state shared revenue while we while the case was litigated at the Supreme Court. Um, also, under it does violate it required that the state reimburse the local government for costs incurred during the legal process. This was an effort that we pursued in 2018. Interestingly, we had the votes. Um, but when, before committee started, uh, before the legislative committee started, uh, unfortunately, the uh, NRA and other gun advocacy groups showed up to the testimony and testified against 
our bill. Um, and uh, that concerned some of the NRA friendly members on the committee who ultimately flipped their votes to no. Um, the, the interesting part is again, nothing in our bill would have changed the Tucson action. Uh, Senator Representative Fincham came from the district that he was making a, a, a district that represents the city he was making a claim against. Uh, and uh, it, the only thing that it would have done is it would have allowed the city direct action to the Supreme Court. So uh, we, didn't, we didn't understand, frankly, why uh, the, the legislators flipped at that time. Unfortunately, they did. Uh, there are narrower margins in the legislature now than there were in 2018. However, some of our strongest advocates uh, will no longer be there in 2021. Uh, and so we will certainly look for opportunities to uh, modify the 1487 statute or get rid of it entirely. Uh, but the likelihood of that in the 2021 session, in particular, post November 3rd election results uh, seems limited, if not, uh, if not impossible at this point in time. So that's all I have on, on the future of S uh, SB 1487. Again, we will continue to, to push on it, but I think at this point in time, we'd be open to, to questions. And I don't know if Christine is doing that or um, if somebody else is. I am. Okay. Well, yeah, just a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A box, either on the top or on the bottom, depending on your device. Um, I've had a couple of questions over the years that I kind of wanted to throw out at you. Um, and actually, first, I guess, Nick, did you want to answer that bond question or? Yes, I'm sorry. I, so the the legislature in my communications with them has no made no indication on a desire to change it but i think certainly if we were to bring something forward then we would actively strike that section of the statute so but nobody has made uh, a request to me or to the league that i'm aware of uh, asking that that provision be be modified in some way great okay and then um i've kind of had a variation of this question asked over the years um, you know, we have a number of cities, obviously, that have ordinances in place, um, you know, for decades, or at least for, you know, a, a well before, um, you know, 1487 was enacted. I guess the question is really, you know, is it all fair game? You know, can they go back to anything that's been, you know, basically been adopted and enforced for years and now uh, file a 1487 claim on that issue? I don't know who wants to take that one. <laughs> Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, yes, they, they can and they have. So it's uh, definitely all fair game. Okay. And then we also have a number of cities and towns who- um... hey, Christina, sorry, oh. Be before we leave that, I 100% I agree with Alexis, they can, they have. Um, I, I, but I, but I want to draw a distinction in terms of what remedy they can get if that happens. So like, you know, if for example, there were an ordinance that has been on the books for 10 years that collects a fee for a certain thing, whatever it might be. And uh, there were to be a 1487 complaint, you know, filed that says, you know, we think this violates whatever crazy state law we dug up. Um, there's nothing about 1487 that would allow the legislature or the courts to like disgorge the money that's already been collected. So that's an important thing that I want to make sure our audience understands is that although um, they could certainly bring a 1487 complaint and we would be down the rabbit hole that we all just talked about. Um, the remedy of 1487 is exclusively limited to state share revenue um, and is prospective. Uh, there's no clawback mechanism. And I just, you know, on the chance that that is something folks are thinking about, I think that's worth mentioning. Okay, perfect, perfect, thank you. Yeah, and I also thought it was interesting and I don't know if you guys have kind of opinions on this, um, I think it was in the Tucson, maybe it was the Tucson case, uh, the first one that with the firearms that the, I almost the remedy that the attorney general sought was not only just to, to avoid the ordinance, but they were also seeking the state shared revenue, which I haven't seen that in any other cases, but I don't know if they were just sort of testing the waters or, um, you know, it seems like the court, you know, obviously struck that down and didn't go forward with that. 
but your thinking is maybe, you know, that wouldn't really be an option. So, um, I mean, I, I look, clearly the law says that state share revenue is at risk mm -hmm. um, if they don't take action. Um, but if the ordinance ceases to, ex I mean, I, so in other words, a city, I think could choose, and this hasn't happened yet, and it's hard to imagine them actually making this choice, um, given the, you know, high percentage of uh, city and municipal budgets that usually come from state share revenue. Uh, but theoretically, the text of the law, in my view, allows a city to choose to just give up the state share revenue and keep their ordinance in place. Now, you know, whether or not there are other things like other principles of law that would allow uh, the Supreme Court to enjoin the ordinance, you know, I think you could probably see the state arguing that, right, which is like, well, you don't actually get that choice, because the law is that state law preempts, um, you know, a, a local ordinance on anything other than local concern, and the court just held mm -hmm. that uh, this isn't local concern, so you can't make that choice, but that the courts haven't decided that yet, you could see that being litigated if a city were willing to forego the state share revenue, but I, I doubt it. <laughs> I guess you're right. That is, I guess that is the option. They could continue what they're doing, but yeah, lose their state shared revenue. So, okay, okay. And I then think I there thought... the, the revenue would be under some, you know, the, the, the legislature or an interested party. I think the interesting thing there would be procedural, right? If the city said, you know what, I, I'm done with you guys in Phoenix on this crazy legislation. Um, we're just gonna, we don't need your state share revenue and we're just gonna do our thing. Um, under 1487, it's not clear that that the um, attorney general would have a, re a remedy, but you could see an interested party, perhaps a citizen who didn't agree with that policy choice, bringing their own lawsuit to enjoin that statute on the grounds that it's just preempted by state law, mm -hmm. but it would be outside the realm of 1487. Right, right, okay, okay. Um, okay, so also, can a citizen of the city oppose Senate Bill 1487 because the threat of it stopped them from getting a service or just on the principle of due process and it being arbitrarily removed? So I guess it's kind of a, can a citizen, I guess, of the city that said oppose 1487. So I guess, has there been any discussion or thought about that? Yeah, I mean, so the way that the process is set up, it really doesn't allow for anyone to be involved in the process besides the city and the state. Um, the, the state has opposed intervention of other parties as have we in these cases. So, I mean, in terms of if there were like sort of an actual lawsuit going forward um, in the 1487 context, it's really only between the city and the state. Um, certainly, were this, I'm struggling to think of an example, but like certainly were a citizen to have a right infringed by 1487, I, I do see a case where they could bring their own lawsuit and sort of raise constitutional challenges related to it. Um, unfortunately, the court in terms of a lot of these issues, except for the does violate state law, issue has has found that 1487 is constitutional doesn't violate the separation of powers you know where there's been judicial review but jay i don't know if you have any other thoughts about that yeah i would just echo what alexa said and and maybe put put another way um you know on behalf of municipalities appearing in these actions and the and also you know the ag has taken the position that this is a this is a very unique uh creature of statute. And this thing, this 1487 process is between the AG and the municipality and everyone else is not a party. Uh, it's unlike other, you know, like rules about, uh, you know, who can intervene and things like that. And honestly, especially because it's at the Supreme Court and we've, you know, um, the Supreme Court, you know, as everyone knows, will freely allow um, amicus briefs. And in fact, the municipalities have a statutory right to file without leave an amicus brief in these actions. So everybody can really find a way to be heard in the context of this action. But could a private citizen bring some kind of action because they were somehow aggrieved by 1487? Maybe, as Alexis said, they could bring some separate action, but that wouldn't allow them to participate in the 1487 process. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, do the panelists know if any City has litigated the T21, the under 21 for tobacco ordinances under 1487. Has the AG basically dropped that complaint? 
So I can I can jump in on this one because that was actually not a 1487 complaint. It was a request for AG opinion um, made by a legislature or a legislator. I'm sorry. Uh, so that legislator made a, a, a request for opinion to the attorney general's office. That was done, I believe, in October of last year, maybe November of last year, um, sometime right around then. Uh, however, when the federal government changed T21 early this year, I can't remember if it was January or February, but early this year, when the federal government changed 21, that was then deemed moot and, and the AG's office is not intent on responding to it. Okay, great, thanks Nick, yeah. Um, also, you know, in the original, I think it was the first filing against Snowflake, um, there was a case, I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on this, where they, the uh, complainant had actually listed like open meeting law violations, public record violations, all sorts of things. And then the AG, I think sort of said there's other mechanisms to address it. So I don't know if that was just the first case type of situation where maybe they were trying to get their footing. I guess, do you see where these issues could be brought up and they have to be addressed within 1487 or if there is other mechanisms in law for those specific types of complaints, they can be sort of pulled out of 1487. Yeah, you know, it, I, it's been a while since I've read that that opinion in full, but um, this this sort of is an issue that relates to the mechanism of 1487 not really being one that allows for factual findings. Um, so generally these cases in terms of, like if the AG is gonna find a conflict, it's usually gonna be on the face of the law and the, um, and the face of the local law and the face of the state law. So in the case of an open meetings violation, um, the, the issue, if I'm remembering it correctly, was whether the town had in fact violated the open meeting laws by holding a certain, certain meeting. And so it wasn't in that case that there was a conflict between the state law and the local law, or it was more of a, a factual thing. So I think, I think what happened in Snowflake and Jay can correct me if he's remembering differently is there were some issues that were sort of more appropriate for that, for that, that forum. Yeah, I, that, so I would also note, you know, back to what we, I talked about a second ago, um, you know, this is of a unique statutory mechanism that's set up between the municipality and the AG with original jurisdiction in the Supreme Court to deal with like one thing. And it's, you know, whether there is a conflict and the, and the state law, as Alexa said, on its face may violate, uh, or the, the local law may violate state law. So, you know, our view of like the advocacy here would be in any case where, let's say the AG's office tried to drag in like a public records complaint and they said, oh, well, we've got an omelet complaint pending and we've got this thing pending. We'll just put them all in the same thing. You know, I, I would oppose that on jurisdictional grounds saying like, well, you can't skip right to the Supreme Court under the public records law. Like you got to follow Title 39 and you got to do um, you got to do what you have to do. You got to go to the Superior Court. You got to bring a special action. Um, I also feel like the um, uh, this the Supreme Court, uh, in my view, would be very unlikely to reach out and grab for even more issues in one of these cases. I think, you know, my view is that the court uh, certainly, you know, is discharging its constitutional, uh, it's uh, it, the duty imposed on it by the legislature to adjudicate these cases in the first instance. Um, but just my personal view is that if you were to poll uh, current and former members of the Arizona Supreme Court as to whether they would object to these cases being assigned in the first instance to a superior court or the Court of Appeals, they would not object. Um, I think it would be perfectly fine to have those cases adjudicated through a more, more regular process. Um, so, you know, I, I would expect that the court would be very um, parsimonious in, in, in choosing to reach out beyond what it's what it has to do under the text of 1487. Yeah, and, and just, you know, looking at the text, it's it's the AG shall investigate any ordinance regulation or other official action adopted or taken by a governing body that that the member alleges violates state law. So, I mean, again, it's, it's sort of this weird, very narrow issue. Um, and just another thing that I'm thinking about that's come up is, you know, as a first principle, and in some of these complaints you see, this has to be an action taken by a governing body of the municipality. So, I mean, you know, think about that when you get one of these complaints too. Is that what this is or is this something else? You know, is this something that 
that maybe the governing body didn't do, but maybe a committee, like maybe some other, you know, part of, of municipal government did, you know, I, it, that issue hasn't been litigated, but I think it's a gating principle that's worth considering, um, especially as some of these legislative complaints, frankly, get a little bit more creative. Yeah, I, I want to, Alexis flagged a really great issue there. Um, you know, cities have lots of things that are not actions of the legislative body, right? So there are city HR policies, there might be other things that, you know, they're written down and they govern certain things within the city or town, but they are not ordinances. And, you know, our view is that this applies to ordinances, things that are the law that were passed through a legislative process. And, you know, I, I think Alexis is 100% correct that there is some room for I, that, that we could anticipate seeing um, challenges that maybe don't fit within that and that it is a gating issue and that any municipality that finds itself under 1487 scrutiny for something that isn't an ordinance or isn't you know, otherwise the law of the city um, should be alert to challenge uh, the jurisdiction of the attorney general's office to even investigate it under 1487. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see, next question here. Uh, how do you or can you attack the constitutionality of the loss of state shared revenue provision within a 1487 case? Yes. Well. <laughs> yeah, no, so I think, um, I think, you know, Jerry, I don't know if you have a better thought about this, but it seems to me like that issue is not gonna be really before the court unless, the the um, municipality decides to keep a law in force um, even after the Supreme Court has 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 weighed in on it or after the AG has made a, a shall finding and I think so I guess in the case of the the AG finding that the law does violate and the city wants to continue going they could definitely file an action and challenge the constitutionality of of um, of, of the ability of the AG to do that in the first place, but I'm not sure there's a great mechanism or one that we've thought of that would that would allow for a challenge of, of the state shared revenue aspect in particular. I don't know, Jay, if you have any other thought about that. I mean, I think for us, it's more of a, a functional challenge of like, how does this statute work? But the fact that, they, that the legislature is trying to attack state shared revenue in general is not something is not something I've given a ton of thought to. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, um, at a sort of first principles level, state shared revenue is a creature of statute. And certainly to the extent it's a creature of statute, the legislature could amend it or change it. And if the legislature wants to condition state shared revenue on certain things, like, you know, they're going to take it away if you don't um, repeal your ordinance. Um, it, it seems likely that they can do that subject to the proper process, right? So I, I, I do believe, and again, this is my personal opinion and the courts have yet to rule on this. And you know, I, there are very smart people who might disagree with me, but it's my personal opinion that if the attorney general were to find that something did violate um, and that you know, issued um, some kind of piece of paper to the state treasurer saying you shall withhold, that, that there are numerous separation of powers and like legal challenges to that process. Um, you know, the state treasurer has a duty to pay out the revenue uh, according to law. And while a court could certainly issue an order to the state treasurer not to, to pay certain revenue, just like a court could issue an order for almost anything to a, a person who was properly before it and had due process and all that other stuff. Um, the attorney general is not empowered to issue, you know, would essentially be a writ of prohibition <laughs> uh, or a restraining order or an injunction against the, the, the treasurer. So I think in terms of implementing that, there are challenges there. And in terms of, uh, you know, whether the AG's unilateral conclusion without a trial, without fact finding, um, that um, in a case that he himself is also the investigator, could he then also be the judge and say like, yeah, no state share revenue for you. I, I think that's a big problem. Um, you know, I suppose, and this isn't something we've researched, um, but it could be interesting. You know, you could, you could, you'd at least want to look at whether or not given the, the passage of time and the way in which Arizona municipal government has involved in the dependency 
on state shared revenue that many cities have, you could try to conjure some argument that, you know, taking away the state shared revenue for this one thing is somehow, uh, you know, an infringement on charter city authority, but, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to get pretty creative there to me. And as I think Alexis said, it's a, it's, it's principally a, a, pro, a due process challenge and a, and a procedural challenge rather than, you know, trying to craft an argument that the legislature lacks the power uh, to, to alter state shared revenue in that way. I think they created it and they can probably legislate around it. Okay, great, thank you. So I also wanted to get kind of your thoughts about, um, you know, we've had a, I think a number of complaints filed and it seems as though that the attorney general's office doesn't want to sort of outright dis dismiss them before kind of conducting that investigation. I think sort of kind of the informal response has been that they don't have statutory authority to just dismiss. Um, I think they have withdrawn, obviously, if the legislator, you know, withdraws the complaint, they've allowed that. But um, do you think that there's some kind of wiggle room in there that if they see a complaint on its face and, and see that it's not actually maybe meeting the requirements of the 1487 provisions that they can dismiss it without actually having the, the city or town respond? Yeah, I mean, I mean, just there, there's one that I'm thinking of in particular, where I think there's been a sense that there really isn't much of a response needed, or maybe the response is a short one page thing. And then the Attorney General's, you know, formal written opinion is one page or two pages. So I think effectively, they've, they've sort of done that um, in, in some cases. So even if it's not a, you know, they've just said, does not violate um, we don't need a whole long thing. I think I think the process is the same. It's just truncated. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, we're we're aware of cases. In fact, we've been involved in cases where the remedy we sought was like we immediately we didn't spend 15 days to write back. Right. We we took one day and wrote a letter that said this is so deficient on its face that we asked that it be summarily dismissed or something like that, and that's what happened. Okay. Okay. So that's at least an option or a request to make. You get that. Yeah. Time. Yeah, and I, I think again, this goes back to something we talked about earlier, which is like there's no the only like law about the procedure here is the attorney general has to report in 30 days, and you know, not surprisingly, um, given that all the parties involved here are are government parties and you know should have an incentive to work together as much as possible, um, we've had very constructive discussions with the attorney general's office and with the people in Bo Royston's office, Solicitor General's office, um, about unusual cases and whether they call for unusual procedures. And I would really encourage people to, 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 you know, keep their creative thinking caps on, so to speak. Okay, great, great. So can you recommend, um, cause for some of our smaller cities and towns, when, you know, I've noticed that maybe sort of like, um, the larger cities have a, a heads up, right? They know that something's coming their way. They've heard a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of traffic about a certain issue and they can anticipate it but we've had some sort of smaller towns that, I mean, they felt kind of blindsided. They didn't really know that it was coming. Now they've had, you know, again, like 14 days to respond to something. They have very minimal amount of resources. You know, are there some sort of guidelines, best practices? I know you've touched on some already about really how, how they should address the complaint. Yeah, I mean, again, I would, I would take a look, you know, just make sure, first of all, is this something that's within the jurisdiction of 1487? Was this something done by your governing body? Was this something that your your council passed or, or something like that? And then I would look like, hey, is there actually a conflict? Because frankly, in a lot of these cases, there isn't, there isn't any conflict. Um, and then, you know, uh, I mean, if, if it's a charter, if it's a charter city, then there's, consider that those issues, are there other constitutional deficiencies with the statute? Um, but you know, <clears throat> it, it's one of those things where it's just an unfortunate time frame that the statute has. And you know, Jay, let me know if you disagree. But I think even if the AG says like you have 15 days to write a letter about this, you know, you can do that. But if you think of something on day 25, you know, I think you should feel free to you know supplement your your position. Um, but yeah, you know, it is unfortunate that there isn't a little bit more time to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because I agree there's some of them are, you know, can be quite complex. Um, and again, when you don't have a heads up that it's coming, 
that's a lot to sort of set aside your normal workload in order to respond to something that obviously is going to have severe consequences for your jurisdiction. Um, so that's that's something I think of concern to a lot of our smaller towns. Yeah, um, it sounds like Nick is trying to, to fix this issue a little bit because I think it's a concern for the attorney general as well. You know, these are some of these issues that are really comp complicated or can be really complicated. And it takes a while just to kind of to puzzle your way through them. So 30 days for the whole thing to be done is is challenging, especially when you know when they're filed on December 15th or something like that, you know? Um, so it's just not it's not a it's not a great time frame. But Nick, I don't know if you have any other thoughts about that based on your discussions. Really yeah, I mean, you know, I think initially the contemplation was um, at least from our side, and this goes back to again 2018. But um, is do you give up any legislative leverage by agreeing to modifications in the time frame while not also getting the other changes that you want to the statute, um, or that we as as the league want to the statute? Um, so we want. Uh, the AG changes, but we also want them with these other changes. And just based on experience, um, sometimes at the legislature, if you take what you can get one year and come back with the, the next year, um, th you are positioned as moving the goalposts on the issue as opposed to um, just satisfying some of the low hanging fruit and then coming back and, and getting getting the full composition of what you needed so it it's more of a strategic conversation than um than anything else uh, at this point in time I, I certainly think it's something that we could discuss with the ag's office they haven't brought it to us since 2018 though yeah i think with the current uh i think makeup of the legislature i think yeah there's there hasn't been much uh interest in probably trying to, to go forward with that. Um, I yeah, also, I'm, go ahead, Nick, sorry. No, I, I also, real quick though, I also think that the concern from, let's say the um, the conservative side of the legislature who, who passed this, and um, certainly I would not suggest that if it was a democratic legislator that they might not have issues that they would pursue as well. But But from the conservative side of the legislature, I think the concern also could be that if you open this up, what provisions do you open up to being added to it? We do have, you know, there are many members at the legislature uh, on both sides of the aisle who are friendly to the league, who certainly understand that there are issues with 1487. And, and so if they were to open a, it up, it, is there an opportunity for us to get something added that we want that, that others may not? So I think that it, that, that, calculus comes from both sides. Yeah, and Jay, were you going to say something? Just just following up on, you know, Christina, your, your note about, you know, our, for, for cities that don't deal with as much of this or who, who are, you know, are sort of more resource constrained, um, I, I really would encourage you to, if you think it's coming, um, call Bo Royston's office. Um, uh, let them know, like, hey, can you let us, you know, like, they, um, you know, try to have a line of dialogue with them. Let them know that um, you're the person to contact and, you know, give them their email address and make sure there's an open line of dialogue. Um, you know, certainly they, I, I will say, and I mean, Alexis and I, one of our most frequent adversaries in litigation is the attorney general's office. So I don't think anyone would accuse us of trying to, um, you know, be be overly friendly to them, but they have been, um, you know, they're, they're, very good to deal with on these things. And, you know, you can have a discussion with them about the process. If you need an extra day or two, um, if you are trying to plan around some personal thing and, you know, like those are, those are conversations that's totally, we would encourage you to have. And, um, you know, I think everyone who's in the process realizes that like these deadlines are just a product of the statute that we all have to work with. And, you know, the more you can agree on the procedural aspects of when the responses are due and what the Supreme Court schedule is going to be, um, you know, the, the the better off you're likely to be. So I would encourage anybody who does get a complaint into their jurisdiction um, not to delay in calling, um, you know, the Solicitor General or whomever in his office is handling it. Um, he has a number of people who have handled these complaints. 
Um, but our experience has been uniformly positive and professional when it comes to the interactions we've had um, in managing the process of these complaints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would second that. I've heard, um, you know, from obviously a lot of our our cities and towns that they've had that, um, you know, positive relationship with the agency. They've been good to work with on these complaints. Um, and I think it's important to note, you know, this was not the attorney general's bill. <laughs> you know, they were sort of selected to be the enforcer of this uh, of these provisions. And so I think they, uh, you know, are just trying to to work through it as best as they can as well. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. Did anybody want to give any sort of final comments before we end? I'll say, I think you ended it pretty well there, Jay. So, <laughs> um, so just a reminder to everybody who's watching, um, especially all the attorneys, this is eligible for CLE credit. Um, and so we'll be sending that CLE form and then actually we'll be sending a link that has this uh, recording um, to, you know, you'll go to YouTube and then under that YouTube, there's like a show me tab and then you'll see the actual PowerPoint and then the CLE form. So you should get that within the next day or so if you're an attendee. Um, and then if you have any other questions, you can obviously reach out to the league and uh, we're just happy to help. So thank you to all the presenters. Really appreciate your time today. And thank you to all who attended. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you. Thank you.